Chapter Fifteen of The Sorcery Club by Elliot O'Donnell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter Fifteen: How Hamar, Curtis, and Kelson entered the astral plane. In order to explain the manner in which Hamar, Kelson, and Curtis were initiated into their new properties i must now go back to the day preceding the gratis performance of the modern sorcery company that is to say the last day of stage one of the compact to kelson the day had been one of the surprises throughout when he arrived at the building in cockspur street he preferred living alone and consequently rented a handsome suite of rooms in john street mayfair he was not a little astonished to meet lillian rosenberg on the staircase i thank you so much she exclaimed shaking hands with him most effusively it is all owing to you i got the post and hamar has engaged you kelson ejaculated why yes didn't you know lillian said with a smile i had a letter from him the very evening of the day i called here did you he never told me anything about it how do you think you will get on oh splendidly the work is interesting and full of variety moreover i like the atmosphere of the place it is so weird i believe the three of you really are magicians if that be so kelson said then we have only acted in accordance with our character in engaging the services of a witch a witch who has already bewitched one member of the trio now please don't go to the expense of lunching out lunch with me instead lunch with me every day it is very kind of you lillian rosenberg replied and i will gladly do so when i am not lunching with mr hamar but he has invited me to have all my meals with him that doesn't mean you are obliged to have them with him every day kelson cried lunch with me this morning i am very sorry lillian rosenberg replied looking at kelson with mock pleading eyes please don't scold me but i really promised mr hamar have tea with me then kelson said i promised him that too supper then kelson said savagely i'm awfully sorry but i'm engaged all this evening and practically every evening with mr hamar kelson asked suspiciously oh no my own private business lillian rosenberg replied do forgive me i should so like to have been able to accept your invitation now i must hurry back to my work and she gave him her hand which kelson held and would have gone on holding all the morning had he not heard hamar's well-known tread ascending the stairs look here he said as they entered his room together i want miss rosenberg to have luncheon with me one day this week and she tells me you have already invited her let her come with me to-morrow it is impossible hamar said now i'll tell you what it is matt i anticipated this the moment i saw you two together and it's got to stop you would genuinely fall in love with that girl or as a matter of fact any other pretty girl if you saw much of her and love i tell you would be absolutely disastrous to our interests you must let her alone absolutely alone i tell you i have given her strict orders she is to confine herself to her work and to me i think you take a great deal too much on yourself i shall see just as much of miss rosenberg when she is disengaged as i please then she shall never be disengaged but come do be sane and put some restraint on this mad infatuation of yours for pretty faces can't you keep it in check anyhow for two years till after the term of the compact has expired then you will be free to indulge it to your heart's content for heaven's sake be guided by me harmony between us must be kept at all costs don't you understand oh yes i understand all right kelson said and i'll try but it's very hard and i really don't see there would be any danger in my taking her out occasionally well i do hamar replied and there's an end to turn to something that may spell business just before i got up this morning i saw a striped figure bending over me a striped figure yes a cylindrical figure about seven feet high without any visible limbs but which gave me the impression it had limbs of a sort if it cared to show them you were frightened naturally so would you have been it didn't speak but in some indefinable manner it conveyed to me the purport of its visit to-night at twelve o'clock we are to go to the house of a hindu called karaver in berners street 
where we shall be initiated into the second stage of our compact i hope to goodness we shan't see any spectral trees or striped figures i've had enough of them kelson said and take care you don't do anything that might lead to the breaking of the compact hamar retorted otherwise you'll see something far worse shortly before midnight hamar curtis and kelson obeying the injunctions hamar had received set off to berners street where they had little difficulty in finding carriver's house to their astonishment carriver was expecting them how did you know we were coming curtis asked a gentleman called here early this morning and told me carriver explained he said three friends of his particularly wished to be on the astral plane at twelve o'clock this evening and that they would each pay me a hundred guineas if i would show them how to get there i demurred the secrets that have come down to me through generations of my cashmere ancestors i tell only to a chosen few those born under the sign of de Jellum brava the stranger showing me the sign written plainer than i have ever seen it in the palm of his hand i at once consented and i had no sooner done so than he vanished i knew then that i had been speaking to an elemental a spirit of my native mountains my nerves are not in a condition to stand much is there anything very alarming in this astral business kelson asked it depends on what you call alarming the indian said coldly i shouldn't be alarmed don't be a fool matt hamar interposed i never saw such a frightened idiot in my life you ought to be ashamed of yourself think of what there is at stake think of lillian rosenberg curtis whispered and be comforted carriver took them upstairs into a dimly lighted attic in the centre of the carpetless floor was a tripod around which the three were told to sit Carriver then proceeded to pour into an iron vessel a mixture composed of one half ounce of hemlock three quarters ounce of henbane two ounces of opium one ounce of mandrake roots two ounces of poppy seeds one half ounce of asafetida and one quarter ounce of saffron are these preparations absolutely necessary kelson asked absolutely Carver said english clairvoyants will doubtless tell you they are not necessary it is their custom with a few slipshod instructions to lead you to suppose that getting on the astral plane is merely child's play it is not it is extremely difficult and can only be done in the first place through the guidance of a skilled oriental occultist he then took a sword and with it making the sign of a triangle in the air afterwards scratched a triangle on the floor over which in red chalk he superscribed a tree an eye and a hand then he heated the mixture in the iron vessel over an oil stove as soon as fumes arose from it he placed it on the tripod crying great spirits of the mountains rivers and bowels of the earth invest me with the heavy seal in order that i may conduct these three seekers after knowledge to the realms of thy eternal phantoms immediately after this oration carriver dipping a twig of hazel in the fumigation waved it north south east and west crying give me authority give me cataladrani and then kneeling down in front of the brazier in a droning voice repeated these words green phantom figures of the air a ready welcome see that you prepare black phantom figures from the earth of friendly salutation see there is no dearth red phantom figures of the furious fire for kindly greeting change your usual ire gray grisly googies from the woods and dells to gentle whisperings change your harrowing yells flogai divas mara rupas footnote nineteen according to brahminical teaching there are seven main classes of spirits some having innumerable subdivisions they are one aripa divas with forms two aripa divas without forms 
both classes one and two are intelligent six principles of certain planets i style them planetians and classify them with all other spirits hailing from jupiter neptune etc three mararupas identical with vice elements four pisachas that is male and female elementaries i have termed them impersonating elementals since they consist of the astral forms of the dead that may be utilized by elementals five asuras that is gnomes pixies etc corresponding to those i have designated vagrarian elementals six monstrosities these i include among vice elementals and vagrarians seven caxasas such as souls of wizards witches and of clever people with evil tendencies scientists with cruel or harsh tendencies such as vivisectionists and sophists all these come under my division of earth-bound phantasms of the dead spirits tied to this earth by passion or vices and i should add to the list militant suffragettes strike agitators hooligans apaches pseudo-humanitarians religious bigots misers all people obsessed with manias idiots epileptic imbeciles and criminal lunatics all such may at times be encountered on the lowest spiritual plane End of footnote. high to the plane the astral plane and to these three poor fools explain explain the secrets that they wish to learn to learn the mixture in the iron vessel was now giving off such dense fumes that hamar curtis and kelson felt their senses slowly ebbing away the dark lithe form of Caraver, his swarthy face and gleaming teeth receded farther and farther into the background whilst his voice appeared to grow fainter and fainter they were dimly conscious that he sprayed them all over with some sweet-smelling scent footnote twenty composed of two drams of myrrh one half ounce of sweet oil two ounces of attar of roses one half ounce heliotrope and one quarter ounce of musk End of footnote. and that he whispered in reality he spoke in his normal tones these words Darkona, Drumer, Duber, Parler, Pumer, Perler, Ataramma, Skatarinek, Uk, Drux, Numig, Viartic, Corsa. Footnote 21. These words are so arranged as to set in vibration and loosen the atmosphere that keeps the spirit incarcerated in the physical body, and so set the latter free. End of footnote then there came a temporary blank which was broken by a sudden burst of light the light at first was so blinding that they involuntarily closed their eyes it was quite different to any light they had been accustomed to it was far more vivid and was in a perpetual state of vibration when they had got sufficiently used to this dazzling effect to keep their eyes open they became aware that they were standing apparently on nothing that the atmosphere was not composed of air such as they knew but of an indescribable something that rendered the act of breathing wholly unnecessary and that all around them was no ground no scenery but only space they had barely finished remarking on these facts when there suddenly glided across their vision forms of every conceivable shape that is those resembling corpses of human beings and animals with bloodless faces glassy eyes and stiff limbs some apparently just dead and others in an advanced state of decomposition all possessed and propelled by impersonating elementals phantoms of actual earth-bound people misers murderers etc several of whom approached the trio and tried to peer into their faces for heaven's sake keep off kelson shrieked as the vibrating form of an epileptic imbecile with protruding blue eyes and pimply cheeks came up to him and thrust his face into his this is a bit thick hamar said vainly attempting to elude the phantom of a short stout woman with a big head and purple face who putting out a large black swollen tongue leered at him curse you damn you curtis screamed throwing out his hands in a vain endeavour to beat off the phantoms of two idiot boys who were trying to bite him with their loose dribbling mouths a little more of this and i shall go mad 
seeing a tall grey phantom with a man's body and a wolf's head bounding up to them kelson would have run away had not hamar whose presence of mind never quite deserted him gripped him by the arm if you leave us matt he said we are lost i feel our safety depends on our keeping together if i'm not mistaken this is a cunning dodge on the part of the unknown to separate us if that happens i feel we may never get back to our bodies and the compact will then be broken we must hang on to each other at all costs so saying he slipped his free arm through that of curtis and the three stood linked together hamar clung on to the other two until his hands grew numb and the sweat stood on his chest and forehead in great beads as figure after figure stealthily and noiselessly approached them kelson and curtis writhed and shrieked and at times it seemed as if the chain must be broken but alarming as were these harrowing types of vice elementals that is nude things with heads of beasts and bodies of men and women grotesque heads malevolent eyes mal-shaped hands headless beasts etc none had so dangerous an effect on the unity of the trio as the alluring types of vice elementals that is shapes of beautiful women that smiled seductively at kelson and resorted to every device to entice him away with them it was then that hamar was taxed to the utmost that he exhausted voice strength and patience in holding kelson back he was about to give in when to his astonishment those vice elementals vanished and a phantasm the exact counterpart of caravur only much taller appeared before them and commenced giving them instructions as to stage two you he said addressing hamar will possess the property of second sight that is the power to see at will earthbound spirits conditionally that you fumigate your room for ten minutes every night before retiring to rest with a mixture composed of two drams of henbane two drams of saffron one half ounce of aloes one quarter ounce of mandrake three drams of solanum two ounces of asafetida that you abstain from animal food and wine and give up smoking that three times every day you bathe your face in distilled water to which has been added three drops of the juice of the whortleberry one drop of the juice of the mountain ashberry one ounce of lavender water one ounce of nitre and one half ounce of tincture of arnica and that just before going to sleep you look for three minutes without blinking at an equilateral triangle transcribed in blood on white paper and composed of these letters and figures and he handed hamar a piece of paper on which were written these symbols k t o p i six x seven four h i p three s four w v two eight so long as you observe these conditions the power will remain with you to-morrow only it will be awarded you without any preparations you he went on turning to kelson will possess the property of projection that is the power of leaving your body and of visiting where you will on the material plane you will continue to possess the same conditionally that you carry out the same rules as leon hamar with the exception that instead of looking at a triangle before going to sleep you will repeat these words see i have written them down for you and he handed kelson a slip of paper on which were transcribed darkona droomer duber parlor poomer perler atarama skatarinek uk drukes numeg viarta corsa you he said turning to curtis will be endowed with the property of overcoming gravity you will be able to fly to jump great heights and to lift and move prodigious weights and this property will remain in your possession during the prescribed period provided you abstain from all animal food from smoking and from drinking alcohol and observe the same rules with regard to fumigating your sleeping apartment and bathing your face as hamar and kelson but always before you attempt to fly or jump 
it will be necessary for you to set in motion certain vibrations in the ether that counteract the attraction of gravity you must repeat the words karjako mandarbsa guasila which i have written on this blue paper and when you want to move or lift objects you must first repeat the words parababo henali okokokotsi which i have written on this green paper gravity as you will see is entirely dependent on sound sound can move mountains it did so in atlantis it did so in egypt making the sign of a triangle an eye and a tree in the air with the forefinger of his left hand he slowly repeated the words barjavka ukputa trilisa and the concluding syllable was no sooner uttered than the trio found themselves standing in berners street but of carver's house the house they had just quitted there was no trace End of section 15. Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California. Chapter 16 of The Sorcery Club by Elliot O'Donnell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter 16. Hamar Makes Advances the doctors had stated that the tenth day would see the crisis of john martin's illness if he could tide over that period he might go on for years without another attack when the momentous day arrived gladys was simply eating her heart out with suspense not a sound was permitted in the house the servants tiptoeing about hardly ventured even to exchange glances the errand boys were waylaid and sent to the right about with a vague notion that if they opened their mouths their heads would be off and some one was posted at the garden gate to deal in a scarcely less summary manner with visitors indeed so fearful was gladys lest her father should hear shiel who had managed to elude her outpost that without meaning it she greeted him curtly and more plainly than politely gave him to understand that she wished him elsewhere what have you been saying to shiel davenport miss templeton asked gladys when they met at lunch i passed him on the road just now and he looked so wretched that despite his ineligibility i felt quite sorry for him i am sure he is very much in love with you nonsense gladys said he's only a boy but boy though it pleased her to call him she knew that he had played a man's part during her father's illness every night he had faithfully performed the role she had allotted to him at the kingsway hall and upon him she was forced to admit the success of the entertainment in a large measure depended without pushing himself or being the least bit officious he had been equally helpful behind the scenes he had held in check all those who taking advantage of her father's absence were disposed to dispute her authority and shirk their work and he had also on her behalf successfully resisted their demand for higher wages and over and above all this he had always considered her personal comfort her meals which she could never bother about for herself when engaged all day at the hall were thanks to him brought to her as punctually and served as daintily as they would have been for her father he had taken every care that she should not be disturbed when resting and there was in short nothing he had not thought of doing to lighten the load so unexpectedly laid upon her shoulders the only fault she could find with him was that he had not gained the good graces of her father the day slowly waned gladys had stolen into her father's room repeatedly to see how he fared and to her his condition had seemed much about the same he was as usual tired and peevish but when at six o'clock she again stole in to peep at him and found him lying back on his pillow absolutely still and motionless and without apparently breathing she was immeasurably shocked had he had another fit or was he dead wild with grief and terror she rushed from the room to the telephone the doctor and met him on the landing you have no need to fear he said to her the moment he had looked at john martin he is sound asleep and when he awakes the crisis will be past to-morrow he may go out for a bit and in a week he will be himself again only you must take care that he does not use his brain too much 
Gladys could hardly restrain her delight. She felt pleased with everything and everybody, and her greeting of Shiel some two hours later at the theatre almost turned his brain. In fact, it was owing to this pleasant surprise that he made one or two stupid mistakes in his performance, and was sharply pulled back to earth by the ironic laughter of the audience. When the entertainment was over, and he was preparing to accompany Gladys as usual to her motor, the thought of her sparkling eyes and animated features again overcame him. "'What shall you advise your father to do?' he asked. "'I think he ought to lose no time in getting a partner,' Gladys replied. "'Someone who can attend to the business side of the concern for him. It is essential he should not be worried about figures.' "'I suppose my services won't be required much longer,' Shiel said, speaking with rather an effort. "'Of course I can't answer for my father,' Gladys replied. "'But I should imagine he would be only too glad to employ you. The only thing is the salary.' You can't live on air, you know, and with the poor attendances he gets now, I don't see how he can afford to pay much. I would work for very little, Shiel said. I should be awfully sorry to give up now. I wonder if you would miss me at all. Of course I should, Gladys retorted. You have behaved admirably, and I am most grateful to you. You needn't be grateful to me. I have never enjoyed anything half so much as I have trying to help you. I am poor, penniless, in fact since my uncle left me nothing but supposing supposing i were to get some lucrative post do you think do you think there would ever be any possibility of of what of your caring for me i am terribly in love with you i fear i must have given you encouragement gladys said i'm awfully sorry you see i never thought of this and i don't know what to say to you won't you give me a chance just a chance but my father would never hear of it unfortunately he seems to be prejudiced against you won't you wait a while and then if you are still in the same mind speak to me again in say a year by that time you will no doubt have made some sort of position for yourself and in the meantime you will get engaged to someone else shiel exclaimed i don't think i shall gladys said of course i meet crowds of men but you see i am not the marrying sort do you think you would care for me just a bit shiel asked eagerly a tiny bit perhaps gladys said but i'm not at all sure i can think of no one now but my father so that if you value my good opinion or really want to prove your devotion to me you must for the time being devote yourself to him who knows it may lie in your power to do him some service i don't see how shiel replied somewhat despondingly but no matter after you your father and your father's affairs shall be my first consideration you will let me see you sometimes won't you sometimes gladys laughed good-bye don't make any mistakes to-morrow your performance to-night was not as good as usual and with this somewhat cruel remark she stepped lightly into her motor and drove off shiel now gave way to despair there were few conditions in life so utterly unenviable as penury and love to be next door to starving and at the same time in love day after day shiel who was thus afflicted had revelled in gladys's company and had intoxicated himself with her beauty fully aware that for each moment of pleasure there would later on be a corresponding moment of pain it was only in romance he told himself that the penniless lover suddenly finds himself in a position to marry in reality his love suit is rejected with scorn his adored one marries someone who has or pretends he has limitless wealth and the despised swain ends his days a miserable and dejected bachelor all the same shiel determined that he would for once fare like the hero in romance that he would either win the object of his affections or perish in the attempt and no sooner did the fit of the blues consequent to the conversation last related wear off than he set to work in grim earnest to discover some means of breaking up the modern sorcery company limited and of restoring to the firm of martin and davenport their former prestige in the meanwhile affairs were by no means stationary as far as hamar and his colleagues were concerned the appearance of their paper to-morrow a morning journal that chronicled faithfully every event of the following day caused a tremendous sensation and the sale of every other paper sank to nil no one naturally wanting to buy the news that had happened yesterday when for the same money they could obtain news of what would happen that very day 
the stupid method of chronicling past events hamar announced in the first issue of his organ was now obsolete it was perhaps good enough for the victorian era but it was utterly out of keeping with the present age of hourly progress who for instance wanted to know that at six p m on the preceding evening there had been a big fire in new york was it not far more to the point for them to learn for example that at two p m on that very day rio de janeiro would be partially destroyed by an earthquake that the post office in king's road chelsea would be broken into by thieves that nelson's monument in trafalgar square would be blown up by suffragettes or something equally fresh and exciting one cannot get thrills at least not the right kind of thrills in reading of what has already taken place to say to ourselves or to a friend just fancy we might have been in that railway accident or in reading of a shipwreck what a mercy we did not embark after all is it not it is not half as enthralling as to be wondering if at eleven o'clock that night when the terrific storm in which twenty-six people will be killed by lightning in various parts of england we shall be among the fatal number one is not much moved to find oneself alive when a danger is past but one does get terribly excited in contemplating the risk we are bound to run of being killed within a week the circulation of to-morrow had gone up from fifty thousand to ten million and hamar inflated with success said to himself now i will go and have another look at john martin when he arrived gladys was in the garden his stealthy approach had given her no chance to escape what is your business she asked glancing nervously in the direction of the house and dreading lest her father should see hamar from his window i've come to see your father hamar said his eyes resting admiringly on her face and then running leisurely over her figure how is the old gentleman he is not well enough to see visitors gladys said with absolute hauteur perhaps you will state your business to me well i don't mind if i do hamar replied let us sit down it's more comfortable than standing and he dropped into a seat as he spoke now i've been noticing he went on that your show in the kingsway is not getting on very well that there are fewer and fewer people there every night and i've no doubt that it will soon have to dry up altogether we on the other hand are doing better and better every night and we shall go on doing better there is no limit to our possibilities we are worth half a million now next year we shall be worth ten times that amount you are optimistical at all events gladys said i can afford to be hamar grinned now do you know what we intend doing before very long i haven't the least idea and i am not in the slightest degree curious aren't you well you should be since it concerns you we mean to buy up the whole of kingsway and later on of course the whole of regent street you are satirical you are not alarmed at the prospect of having me for a landlord i don't understand you the hall in kingsway is my father's own property if that is so then you have nothing to fear hamar laughed but i think it just possible you are mistaken at any rate i've been in communication with someone styling himself as the landlord my father would have an agreement anyhow gladys said of course hamar replied and i've a pretty shrewd idea of the terms of it but enough of this let me come to the point i intend buying the property and i shall refuse to renew your father's lease unless he agrees to give me what i want of course a preposterous price no you only you me yes i've never seen a girl i like more i've limitless wealth and i'll give you everything you want a steam yacht motors diamonds anything everything and all i ask in return is that you should consent to be engaged to me on trial say for fifteen months just to see how we get on what pretty hands you have and before gladys could draw them away he had caught hold of them in an iron grasp and turning them over cast admiring glances at the slim white fingers with the long almond-shaped and carefully manicured nails i reckon he said i shall never find any one prettier all through what do you say your proposition is impossible monstrous i detest you gladys retorted her cheeks white with anger leave go my hands at once and never let me see you again 
i can't promise not to see you again hamar said but i'll let go your hands now for i'm no more a lover of scenes than you i anticipated a little fuss at first it's the way all you women have you are so modest you don't like to appear too eager to snap up a good offer you'll close with it right enough in the end i'll call again in a few days by that time you may have changed your mind and before she could prevent him he had again seized her hand and was kissing it over and over again with an ejaculation of the utmost indignation she sprang away from him and with all the dignity she could assume walked to the house what became of him she did not know some few seconds later she told the gardener to see him safely off the premises but he was nowhere to be found a week later hamar turned up again at the cottage and despite the vigilance of gladys and the servants caught john martin alone when the latter at last came to the end of what had at first seemed an inexhaustible stock of invectives hamar stated his proposals with mathematical exactitude i don't believe for one moment my landlord would be such a blackguard as to play into your hands john martin spluttered oh yes he would hamar replied an englishman will do anything for money and i am prepared to offer him just twice as much as any one else for your hall do you think he will refuse not he but what on earth's your object you've ruined me already your daughter hamar cried miss gladys i am prepared to go to any lengths to get her refuse to give her to me and i'll turn you out of your hall i'll torment you with every kind of insect i'll plague you with disease i'll make your life hell but give her to me and i'll but i won't and i defy you to do your worst you you and there is no knowing what would have happened had not gladys suddenly come in and dragged her father out of the room how dare you she exclaimed returning to the study to find hamar still there i've telephoned to the police and unless you go instantly and promise not to come again i shall give you in charge for annoyance foolish of you very foolish hamar said when i want to be friendly sooner or later you must give in so why not end all this needless unpleasantness now and receive me if not with open arms at least amicably you are so awfully pretty i must have just one but before he could kiss gladys the police arrived and hamar once more retired with somewhat undignified haste and more than a little discomfited on arriving in cockspur street hamar's temper underwent a still further trial kelson taking advantage of his absence had gone off to tea with lillian rosenberg in ill-suppressed fury he waited till they returned a word with you matt he said as kelson tried to shuffle past him so this is the way you behave when my back is turned i suppose you've had a good time delightful and you know the consequences only that i'm looking forward to the same thing another day she'll go she won't kelson chuckled she is far too valuable so there old man a month ago your threat might have held good it won't now you daren't you positively daren't part with her because if you do so you'd not only part with a good few of your secrets but you'd part with me End of chapter 16, read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California. Chapter 17 of The Sorcery Club by Elliot O'Donnell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter 17 The Course of True Love what's to be done with matt hamar asked curtis soon after the interview just recorded he's as sweet on rosensburg as he can be and says if i dismiss her he'll go too then don't dismiss her curtis replied leave them both alone that's my tip i don't believe matt's such a fool as to fall in love and i'm quite sure the girl isn't why she went to the tivoli with me two nights ago and to the empire with another fellow the night before that it isn't in her to stick to one and she would go with any one who would treat her don't worry your head over that matt may say how about leon and gladys martin so he might but there's no danger there the girl is deuced pretty splendid eyes hair teeth hands and all that sort of thing and i've set my heart on a bit of canoodling with her but as for love well it's not in my program still stranger things have happened curtis said 
anyhow i guess you're both mad and that i'm the only sane one give me a ten-course dinner at the savoy and you may have all the women in london i don't go a cent on them to revert to kelson from the hour he had first seen lilian rosenberg he had become more and more deeply enamoured in the hope of meeting her he had hung about the halls and passages of the building had never missed an opportunity of speaking to her of feasting himself upon the elfish beauty of her face of squeezing her hand and of telling her how much he admired her you really mustn't she said mr hamar has given me strict orders to attend to nothing but my work oh damn hamar kelson replied if i choose to talk to you it's no business of his you've not treated me well i got you the post and it is i you should go out with not hamar and in the quiet nooks and corners perched on window-sill with one eye kept warily on the guard for fear of interruptions he told her his history all about himself from the day of his birth told her about his parents his childhood his school days his hobbies and cranks his indiscretions extravagancies his carousals debts flirtations with just an excusable amount of exaggeration he even went so far as to speak of a chronic rheumatism of a twinge of hereditary gout and of a slightly hectic cough with which he suddenly remembered he had at one time been troubled don't you think lillian rosenberg said with mock earnestness you are somewhat rash have you forgotten that no woman can keep a secret and you are not telling me one secret but many supposing in a fit of thoughtlessness or absent-mindedness i were to divulge them i should never forgive myself would it distress you so much of course it would i should be miserable she laughed and kelson unable to restrain himself seized her hands and smothered them with kisses your fingers would look well covered with rings he said i will give you some and you shall come with me and choose only on no account tell hamar and he kissed her not on the hands this time but the lips hamar saw him he watched him from behind the angle of the passage wall but he said nothing at least nothing to kelson it was to lilian rosenberg he spoke it's really not my fault she said i don't encourage him and if you take my advice you will not interfere for i am sure at present he means nothing serious he is the sort of man who imagines himself in love with every one he meets if you prevent him seeing me you may actually bring about the results you are most anxious to avoid i'll risk that hamar said and i absolutely forbid you doing more than merely saying good morning to him it is either that or you must go well of course i will do as you wish lillian said i don't care a snap for him and after all you ought to know your own business best it is only natural that you should want him to marry someone who can bring money into the firm i don't want him to marry at all or anyhow not yet however there is no necessity to discuss that point we have definitely settled the line you are to adopt and that is all i wanted to speak to you about when next you feel inclined to flirt come to me and you shall have kisses as well as rings it was shortly after this tete -a -tete that lilian rosenberg was interrupted in her work by a rap at the door come in she said and a young man entered i believe a clerk is wanted here he explained i've come to apply for the situation can i see mr hamar i'm afraid he is out there is no one in at present lilian rosenberg replied eyeing the stranger critically if you like to wait a while you may do so sit down she signalled to him to take a chair and went on typing for some minutes the silence was unbroken save for the tapping of fingers and the clicking of the machine then she looked up and their eyes met it is not pleasant to be out of work he said have you ever experienced it once or twice she said and i never wish to again you don't look as if you were much used to office work no i'm an artist but times are hard with us the present government has driven all the money out of the country and no one buys pictures now so i'm forced to turn my hand to something else i love pictures my father was an artist then we have something in common the young man said would you like to see my work i love showing it to people who understand something about painting and are not afraid to criticize i should like to see it immensely though i don't presume to criticize 
may i inquire your name the young man asked eagerly mine is shiel davenport and mine lilian rosenberg the girl said with a smile if i don't get the post may i write to you sometimes miss rosenberg and ask you to my studio i call it a studio though it's really only an attic lilian rosenberg nodded i shall be delighted to come she said i am afraid i am very unconventional there was no time for further conversation as hamar entered the room at that moment what do you want he asked curtly shiel told him you're too late hamar said i've engaged someone if you'd called earlier there might have been some chance for you as you look tolerably intelligent but it's no use now so be off as shiel left the room he caught lilian rosenberg looking at him and he saw that her eyes were full of sympathy the acquaintance thus begun ripened she went to see his pictures they had tea together and they spent many subsequent hours in each other's company and though shiel saw in lilian rosenberg only a rather prepossessing girl from whom after cultivating her acquaintance he was hoping to learn the inner working of the modern sorcery company limited with her it was different in shiel lilian rosenberg saw the qualities she had always been seeking the qualities she had most despaired of ever finding and which she had so often declared existed only in fiction he only interested her she argued but she forgot that interest as well as pity is akin to love and that where the former leads the latter almost invariably follows i don't believe you have enough to eat she said to him one day you are a perfect shadow how do you exist if you have no private means i just manage to exist and that is all shiel laughed and he spoke the truth his present state of semi-starvation having resulted from the untoward events which had happened prior to his application for the post of clerk to the modern sorcery company limited and his subsequent acquaintance with lilian rosenberg whilst john martin had been ill and he had helped at the hall in king's way he had lived well gladys had taken care he was paid not a big sum to be sure but enough to keep him but directly john martin in spite of gladys's remonstrances had resumed work shiel had been dismissed i wish i could help you john martin said to him for i really feel grateful to you for all you have done but to tell you the candid truth i can't afford to pay any salaries as you know the receipts of the hall are next to nothing but the expenses continue just the same rent gas and staff all heavy items moreover at your uncle's death many of his creditors put claims on the firm for debts debts he had incurred without either my sanction or knowledge and it has been a serious drain on me to pay them off in fact my finances are now at such a low ebb that i cannot possibly do anything for you if only the modern sorcery company could be cleared off the scenes you would i suppose feel extremely grateful to whoever cleared them off i would john martin replied with a significant chuckle even though it were someone who had not stood very high in your estimation even though it were the devil now look here mr martin shiel said trying to appear calm i will devote all my energies and all my time to your cause the overthrow of the modern sorcery company if only if only in the event of my being successful you will give me some hope of being permitted to win your daughter i promise you that hope and any other you may see fit to aspire to john martin said with a grim smile since there isn't the remotest chance of your succeeding in the task you have set yourself believe me it will take both money and wits to get the better of hamar curtis and kelson anyhow i have your permission to try i shall do my best you may do what you like john martin rejoined so long as you don't talk to me about gladys till you've redeemed your pledge that is to say till you've overthrown the modern sorcery company in the meanwhile i must ask you to abstain from seeing her i'm afraid i can't promise that can't promise that john martin cried his eyes suffusing with sudden passion can't you then damn it you must i'm not going to have my daughter throw herself away on a penniless puppy there curse it all you know what i think of you now you are a bumptious puppy and i swear you shall not come within a mile of her i shall shiel retorted drawing himself up to his full height i shall see her whenever she will permit me and since she is not at home at the present moment 
I shall now await her return outside the house and defy the savage old bulldog inside it, leaving John Martin too taken aback with astonishment to articulate a syllable, Shiel withdrew. True to his word, he waited to see Gladys. He paced up and down the road in front of the house from eleven o'clock in the morning, when his interview with John Martin had terminated, till eight o'clock in the evening, and was just beginning to think he would have to give up all hope of seeing her that day when she came in sight. Really, she exclaimed after Shiel had explained the situation, do you mean to say you have stayed here all day? Of course I have, Shiel answered. I told your father I would see you, and I meant to stay here till I did. And what good has it done you? All the good in the world. I shall sleep twice as well for it. I'm more in love with you than you think, and I mean to marry you one day. My prospects at present are absolutely Thames embankmentish but no matter i've hit upon a capital way of ferreting out the secrets of the modern sorcery company i shall get employed by them and he told gladys of the advertisement he had seen in the paper well i wish you all success she said but i'm afraid you've upset my father dreadfully and the doctor says excitement is the very worst thing for him and may lead to another stroke you must on no account come here again until i give you leave but may i see you elsewhere if you're a wise man you'll do one thing at a time you'll discover the secret of the sorcery company first and then when i have discovered it my father may forgive you have i told you i'm going on the stage i know bromley berman and he's offered me a part at the imperial it is imperative now that i should do something to help my father if you become an actress shiel said bitterly my chances of marrying you will be indeed small not smaller than they are now gladys observed au revoir and with one of those tantalizing and perplexing smiles with which some women consciously or unconsciously counteract and sometimes perhaps for reasons best known to themselves completely nullify the needless severity of their speech shook hands with shiel and left him End of chapter 17 Read by Don W. Jenkins Rancho San Diego, California Chapter 18 of The Sorcery Club by Elliot O'Donnell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins Chapter 18 Stage 3 The week sped by gladys martin went on the stage and thanks to beauty and influence rather than to talent though in the latter respect she was certainly not wanting she became an immediate success her photos some taken alone and some with bromley berman occupied a conspicuous place in all the weekly illustrateds and in innumerable shop windows people talked of her as they do of all actresses some said her father was a broken-down peer some a needy parson and some a policeman some said the duke of warminster was madly in love with her others that seaton smythe the notorious cabinet minister was pining for a divorce on her behalf and others that she was seldom seen off the stage she was entertaining the king and the belgians i've met her lillian rosenberg said to shiel as they stopped one evening to gaze at gladys's portraits outside the imperial theatre she came to our place to have a dream interpreted and i thought nothing of her i don't admire her the least bit in the world do you i do shiel replied rather sharply why you sound quite angry lillian rosenberg laughed one would think you knew her i wonder if bromley berman is very much in love with her he looks as if he were in those photographs do you think it possible for a man and woman to make love to each other every night on the stage like they do without one or the other of them being affected i really couldn't say shiel replied i'm no authority on such matters they don't interest me in the least but this was an untruth they did interest him and very much too he seldom indeed thought of anything else had gladys fallen in love with bromley burnham could she resist the fascinations of so handsome a man he did not of course pay any heed to the gossip that coupled her name with dukes and other notorieties he knew gladys too well for that but when he saw her thus photographed clasped in the arms of bromley burnham he had grave apprehensions he longed to see her to ask her if she were still free 
but his every attempt failed she always avoided him and there was no other alternative save to further his scheme his scheme for crushing the sorcery company and to hope for the best and then these dark days of his life when he was tormented by the yellow demon of jealousy and at the same time endured hunger lilian rosenberg was his solacing angel utterly regardless of appearances she did not exaggerate when she said i am not conventional i don't care twopence for mrs grundy she visited him in his garret and she seldom went empty-handed i don't want your things he rudely expostulated when she loaded his table with cold chicken jellies and potted meats i'm not starving yes you are she said and you've got to eat all i bring you and she made him eat she made him too go for walks with her and she insisted that he should go with her on saturday afternoons for long rambles in the country knowing all the time that kelson was eating his heart out for love of her and prophesying all kinds of terrible happenings to himself unless she returned his affections up to this point at all events shiel did not allow his friendship with lillian to blind him to the fact that he was cultivating her acquaintance with a set object he frequently sounded her to see how much she knew of the inner workings of the firm and he satisfied himself that she knew very little they never discuss their powers in my presence she told him but i see them do very queer things mr kelson seldom walks to his room he flies he takes a little jump into the air moves his arms and legs as if he were swimming and flies upstairs along the corridor and what do you think happened the other day some men were carrying into the building a huge oak chest and several large pictures that mr hamar had bought on sale when mr kelson arrived on the scene there is no need to lift these things he said to the man put them down he then made some rapid signs in the air and muttered something whereupon the chest and pictures rose in the air and followed him into the building and up the stairs to their respective quarters surprised lillian rosenberg ejaculated they were simply bowled over and looked at one another with such idiotic expressions in their bulging eyes and gaping mouths that i nearly died with laughter and you've no idea how kelson did that trick none excepting of course that the signs he made and what he said must have something to do with it it was on the tip of shiel's tongue to ask her if she would try and find out for him but he checked himself even at this juncture of their friendship he dare not appear too curious he must wait to go back to hamar he had seen gladys act he had become more infatuated with her than ever and his passion was stimulated by the knowledge that she was universally admired and that half the men in london were dying to be introduced to her many will do anything one of hamar's friends they were all jews remarked to him offer the manager of the imperial a hundred pounds and he'll do anything you like with regard to the girl every manager can be bought and every actress too the suggestion was a welcome one and hamar acted on it but whether or not the exception approves the rule he was immeasurably disconcerted to find that with regard to money and managers his friend had deceived him far from being pleased at the offer of a bribe the manager of the imperial an old harovian raised his foot and hamar who invariably paled at the prospect of violence hurriedly withdrew on the eve of the initiation into stage three the trio were very much perturbed i hope to goodness nothing will appear to me kelson said my heart isn't strong enough to stand the shock of seeing striped figures they should come to you curtis a few jumps wouldn't do you any harm you're fat enough agreeing each to sleep with a light in his room they separated and about two o'clock curtis who had been suffering of late from his liver the effect so the doctor told him of living a little too well and could not sleep heard a knock at his door to his astonishment it was kelson kelson in his pyjamas hallo curtis exclaimed what on earth brings you here and however did you come the usual way kelson said in what struck curtis as rather unusual tones i flew here to tell you that we are now in stage three give me paper and ink i want to write down the instructions i have received curtis conducted him into his sitting-room switched on the lights and giving him what he wanted poured out a couple of tumblers of soda and milk this will lower my temperature he said to himself i shall know if i'm dreaming 
then he sat by kelson's side and observed what he wrote the properties of walking on the water and of breathing under the water are conferred on you during the forthcoming stage you must refrain from red flesh and alcohol but may eat poultry fish fruit and vegetables in abundance the devil i may curtis said in a fury how very kind i would rather have roast beef than all the pullets and kippers in christendom without noticing his interruption kelson went on writing you must also concentrate for one hour every morning grade two in the scale of concentration though sufficient for projection through ether will not enable you to offer sufficient resistance to the pressure of water you must reach grade three on the scale of concentration before you can either walk on or breathe under the water from six to seven a m you must fix your eyes on a glass of fresh spring water and concentrate your very hardest on amalgamating with it on passing your immaterial ego into it at night before going to bed you must drink a mixture composed of two drams of vindru sokum one dram of harnoon obi and one ounce of distilled water vindru sokum and harnoon obi are a species of seaweed the former of a pale salmon colour the latter of a deep blue they were formerly shrubs grown in the wood of endelmoker in atlantis and are now to be found at a depth of two hundred fathoms twenty miles to the northeast of Achill island these weeds must be well rinsed first and when the prescribed amount of each has been carefully cut off and weighed it must be boiled in distilled water and the compound thus formed allowed to cool before being drunk this mixture renders the lungs immune to the action of fluid and will enable you to breathe as easily in water as in air there is still however the action of gravity to be considered and this must be counteracted by sound before experimenting these atlantean words must be repeated aloud in the following order karma nardka rapto numen karma ula piskuste it's all very well to write these directions curtis said but how am i to obtain the weeds i can't go fish for them you must engage the services of mr john whaley formerly employed by the brazilian government in repairing marine cables he will do all you want for the sum of two hundred pounds kelson left off writing and wishing curtis good night walked out of the room you'll be deuced cold without an overcoat curtis called out after him won't you have mine but there was no reply and though curtis strained his ears to listen he could catch no sound of a vehicle kelson left curtis at twenty minutes past two at half past two hamar who had been sound asleep was awakened by a loud rap kelson he gasped how on earth did you get here are you a projection don't worry me with questions kelson replied i come to give you instructions a paper and ink quick hamar obeyed with alacrity on you kelson wrote is conferred the property of invisibility a property common in atlantis and still possessed by the fakers of hindustan the natives of easter island and certain tribes in new guinea you must reach grade three in the scale of concentration by concentrating from five to six o'clock every morning on amalgamating yourself with the ether you must sit with your head thrown back gazing up into space allowing nothing to distract your mind wholly and solely your thoughts must be fixed on the ether this property of invisibility can only be successfully practised when the third grade in the scale of concentration has been reached carry out these instructions and in a week's time you will then be able to experiment to become invisible at will but before experimenting it will always be necessary to repeat the words bakra naka taxomana and to swallow a pill composed of two drams of derhens vaskri one dram of carcavoli and one dram of saffron derhens voskri and carcavoli are a crimson and white species of seaweed that grows on the hundred fathom level thirty miles west southwest of the aran islands galway bay mr john whaley employed by the brazilian government for repairing cables will procure these ingredients for you to become visible you've only to repeat the words bakra naka taxomana backwards 
but how about my clothes hamar asked will they disappear too everything kelson answered hat boots tie and breeches all you have on good night and walking out of the room he leaped into the air and flew downstairs but though hamar listened attentively he could not hear him leave the building there was no sound of any door when they met the following midday in cockspur street kelson remembered nothing of his visits all i know is he said that the moment i got into bed i fell asleep and suddenly found myself standing in a kind of brown desert talking to a tall man with most peculiar features and eyes and a dazzling white skin he informed me he had been an animal trainer in the state of Balancan, atlantis and was ordered to give me instructions as to the taming of the present-day wild beast you must obtain a stone called the red larynx he said it is to be found in great quantities on the three hundred fathom level forty miles to the west-southwest of north erin island and can be procured for you by the same man that gets the weeds for hamar and curtis it is a blood-red pebble covered with particularly vivid green spots and cannot be mistaken sit with it pressed against your forehead for an hour every morning and concentrate hard on amalgamating yourself with it that is passing into it and its properties will gradually be imparted to you do this regularly for a week and by the end of that time you will be able to experiment with animals all you will have to do will be to hold the stone slightly clenched in your left hand whilst with your right you make these signs in the air and he showed me certain passes stare fixedly into the animal's eyes all the while and by the time you have finished making the passes you will find the animals are subdued pronounce these words metarakava avakana holding up as you do so your right hand with the thumb turned down and held right across the palm and the little finger stretched out as wide as it will go and you will understand what any animal wishes to say he ceased speaking and approaching close to me tapped my forehead whereupon there was a blank and on recovering consciousness i found myself in bed feeling somewhat exhausted and very cold you have no recollection of coming to see us in your pyjamas about two o'clock in the morning hamar asked don't talk rot kelson said i'm in no mood for fooling i've got a chill on my liver what was it leon curtis inquired a case of unconscious projection hamar said clearly the work of the unknown we must commence carrying out the instructions at once at the end of a week hamar kelson and curtis began to put in practice their newly acquired properties hamar tested his in a first-class railway carriage on the london brighton and south coast railway i'll go for a day's trip to brighton he said and cheat the company they deserve it he went to victoria and ignoring the booking office calmly seated himself in a first-class compartment where amongst other occupants sat a quite remarkably proper-looking clergyman and a very handsomely dressed lady with a haughty stare and a typical nouveau riche nose when the ticket collector came round before the train started hamar waited till everyone else in the compartment had shown him their tickets and then just as the man was about to demand his swallowed one of the prescribed pills repeating immediately in a loud voice which caused considerable excitement among the other passengers the words bakra naka taksomana the next moment he had disappeared strike me red the collector gasped putting one hand to his heart and grasping at the door with the other what's become of him was he a a, a ghost i don't know er, what to make of it the parson said heroically preserving his oxford drawl in despite of his chattering teeth i don't er, of course believe in ghosts he must er, have been a, a, an evil spirit dear me ah oh. help me out of the carriage at once the lady with the stare panted i consider the whole thing most disgraceful i shall report it to the company what's the matter joe an inspector called out threading his way through the crowd of people that had commenced to collect at the door of the compartment i'm blessed if i know the collector said the only explanation i can give is that a gent who was seated here has dissolved the hot weather has melted him like butter at this there was a shout of laughter the inspector slammed the door the guard whistled and the next moment the train was off 
as soon as the train was well out of the station hamar repeated the words he had used backwards and he was once again visible the effect of his reappearance amongst them was even more striking than of his previous disappearance take it away take it away the lady opposite him shouted throwing up her hands to ward him off it's there again take it away i shall die i shall go mad how oh, hideous how oh, diabolical a stout elderly man said in slow measured tones as if he were reading his own funeral service it must be the devil the devil ha and burying his face in his hands he indulged in a loud fit of mirthless laughter why don't you do something talk theology to it exercise it a remarkably plain woman in the far corner of the carriage said in highly indignant tones to the clergyman as usual whenever there is something to be done it is a woman who must do it she got up and casting a look of infinite scorn at the clergyman whose condition of terror prevented him uttering even the one telling biting word suffragette that had risen and stuck in his throat raised her umbrella and before hamar could stop her struck it vigorously at him ghost demon devil she cried i know no fear begone and the point of her umbrella coming in violent contact with hamar's waistcoat all the breath was unceremoniously knocked out of him and with a ghastly groan he rolled off his seat onto the floor where he writhed and groveled in the most dreadful agony whilst his assailant continued to stab and jab at him in all probability she would have succeeded eventually in reaching some vital part of his body had not one of the frenzied passengers pulled the communication cord and stopped the train End of chapter 18 Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California Chapter 19 of The Sorcery Club by Elliot O'Donnell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins Chapter 19 A Series of Misadventures with the advent of the guard hamar's assailant was dragged off him and he was locked up in a separate compartment to be given in charge so the indignant official announced directly they had got to brighton but hamar ordained it otherwise as soon as he had sufficiently recovered from the effects of the severe castigation the female furioso had inflicted on him he became invisible and when the train drew up at the brighton platform and a couple of policemen arrived to march him on he was nowhere to be found this was his first experiment with the newly acquired property in future he said to himself before i try any tricks i'll take very good care there are no suffragettes about in london there was of course no need for him to ever pay fares all he had to do was to become invisible as soon as the taxi stopped calmly step out of the vehicle and walk away as for meals he was able to enjoy many gratis he simply walked into a restaurant fed on the very best and then disappeared of course he could not repeat the trick in the same place and cautious though he was he was at last caught it appears that a description of him had been circulated among the police and that private detectives were employed to watch for him in the principal hotels and restaurants consequently directly he entered the grill room at the piccadilly hotel he was arrested and handcuffed before he had time to swallow a pill he was now in a most unpleasant predicament the tightest corner he had ever been in supposing he could not escape his sentence would be at least two years penal servitude what would happen curtis and kelson would never work the show without him curtis would give himself entirely up to eating and drinking kelson would marry lillian rosenberg the compact with the unknown would be broken and after that he dare not think he must escape he must get at the pills the police took him away in a taxi and all the time he sat between them he struggled desperately to squeeze his hands through the small cruel circle that held them it's all right for curtis and kelson he said to himself all right at least now they know nothing they have never tried to think what the breaking of the compact means their weak silly minds are entirely centred on the present the present damn the present they are fools idiots imbeciles who think only of the present it's the future it's the future that matters 
he scraped the skin off his wrists he sweated he swore and it was not until one of the detectives threatened to wrap him over the head that he sullenly gave in and sat still the taxi drew up in front of the gerald road police station and hamar was conducted to an ante-room prior to being taken before the inspector just as a policeman was about to search him he made one last desperate effort look here he said if i pledge you my word i'll not attempt to do anything will you let me have my hands or at least one of my hands free a moment some grit has got in my eye and i cannot stand the irritation that game won't work here one of the detectives said you should keep your eyes shut when there's dust about or else not have such protruding ones hamar threatened to report him to the home secretary for brutal conduct but the detective only laughed and hamar had to submit to the mortification of being searched what are these a detective said fingering the seaweed pills stomachache pills hamar said bitterly they are taken as a digestive after meals you look dyspeptic have one no none of your sauce the detective said you come along with me and hamar was hauled before the inspector can i go out on bail hamar asked certainly not the inspector replied then i shan't give you my name and address hamar said i shan't tell you anything the inspector merely shrugged his shoulders and after the charge sheet was read over hamar was conducted to a cell this is awful he said what the deuce am i to do to send for curtis and kelson would be fatal and it would be equally fatal to leave them in ignorance of what has happened to me i am indeed in the horns of a dilemma i must get at those pills up and down the floor of the tiny cell he paced his mind tortured with a thousand conflicting emotions and then an idea struck him he would ask to be allowed to see his lawyer cotton's the man he said to himself he will get the pills for me the inspector after satisfying himself that cotton was on the register rang him up and after an hour of terrible suspense to hamar the lawyer briskly entered his cell they conferred together for some minutes and having arranged the method of defence cotton was preparing to depart when hamar whispered to him i want you to do me a particular favour in the top right-hand drawer of the chest of drawers in my bedroom in cockspur street i have left a red pill-box those pills are for indigestion i simply can't do without them will you get them for me what to-night the lawyer asked dubiously yes to-night hamar pleaded i'll make it a matter of business between us get me the pills before eight o'clock and you shall have a thousand pounds down my cheque-book is in the same drawer the lawyer said nothing but gave hamar a look that meant much again there was a dreadful wait and hamar had abandoned himself to the deepest despair when cotton reappeared he shook hands with his client slipping the pills into the latter's palm whilst the lawyer was pocketing his check hamar gleefully swallowed a pill and crying bakra naka taxomana vanished heaven preserve us what's become of you cotton exclaimed putting his hand to his forehead and leaning against the wall for support am i ill or dreaming anything wrong sir a policeman inquired opening the cell door and looking in why what have you done with the prisoner where is he i have no more idea than you the lawyer gasped he was talking to me naturally and then he suddenly left off said something idiotic and disappeared hamar did not dolly he quietly slipped through the open door and darting swiftly along a stone passage found his way to the entrance which was blocked by two constables with their backs to him i'll give the brute something to remember me by hamar chuckled and taking a run he kicked first one and then the other with all his might precipitating them both into the street he then sped past them home hamar by astute inquiries learned that the police had decided to hush up the affair not being quite sure how they had figured or indeed what had actually occurred as to cotton the shock he had undergone at seeing hamar suddenly melt away before his eyes was so great that he went off his head and had to be confined in an asylum after this adventure hamar shunned restaurants and manipulating his new property sparingly and with the utmost caution warned kelson and curtis to do the same i'll bet anything he said to them it was a put-up job on the part of the unknown a cunning device to make us break the compact 
oh we'll be careful enough as far as that goes curtis growled it's this vegetarian diet i can't stick fancy living on beans and potatoes and only milk and aerated water to wash them down it was bad enough in san francisco when we hadn't the means even to smell meat cooking but with the money literally burning a hole in one's pocket it's ten times worse whatever the unknown has in store for us it can't be worse hell than what i've got now what say you matt the same precisely the same kelson said only it's love not potatoes and beans that worries me in the old days when i was penniless i did get some consolation from knowing it was all hopeless but now now when ed says the money's literally burning a hole in one's pocket and everything might go swimmingly not to be allowed even to buy a bracelet is more than human nature can endure i certainly can't conceive a hell to beat it don't be too sure hamar said and for goodness sake don't let the unknown give you an opportunity of comparing the night succeeding this conversation hamar curtis and kelson introduced their new properties into the programme of their entertainment in cockspur street and london got another big thrill hamar exhibited such startling proofs of his power of invisibility that not only was the whole audience convinced but from amongst certain prominent members of the council of the psychical research society who were attending with the express purpose of unmasking hamar two had epileptic fits on the spot and several before they could get home became raving lunatics at the commencement of the second part of the programme the audience was still too flabbergasted to fully grasp what was happening they saw on the stage a huge tank of water with which they were told mr curtis would experiment what i am about to do mr curtis who now walked onto the stage informed his audience is quite simple all you want is faith those of you who are christian scientists should be able to do it as easily as i say i will i will walk on water and your faith your colossal faith faith in your ability to do it will actually enable you to do it curtis then repeated in tones that could not be heard by the audience the atlantean cabalistic words karma nardka raptonumen k arma ula piscusti and glided gracefully on to the surface of the water every now and then he sank slowly down to the bottom where he strolled about or sat or lay down the audience was simply fascinated nothing they had hitherto seen tickled their fancy half as much as an american who was present put it to live under the water like a fish is immense so hygienic and economical though the time apportioned to this part of the entertainment was half an hour it was extended to over an hour and even then the audience was not satisfied they would have gone on watching curtis eating drinking jumping skipping singing and chasing goldfish under the water all night when he was at length permitted to come out of the tank exhausted and sulky they gave him even heartier applause than they had given hamar but the cup of their enjoyment was not yet full the greatest treat of all was in store for them for the third and last part of the entertainment a cage containing a large bengal tiger was wheeled on to the stage you look precious white curtis remarked just as kelson was about to go on i guess you'd look the same kelson retorted if you had to hobnob with a tiger the unknown always gives me the nasty jobs and in this case curtis said with a low mocking laugh it also loads you with consolations the house is full of ladies who adore you and if you are eaten just think of the sympathy welling up in their beautiful eyes if that isn't sufficient compensation for you i but the remainder of his encouraging speech was lost in a loud roar the bengal tiger shook its bars the audience screamed and curtis flew with a desperate attempt to look calm kelson clutching the red larrick stone in his left hand walked on to the stage whilst the tiger rearing on its hind legs tried to reach him with its paws there were loud cries of oh oh from the audience and kelson's heart beat quicker when a girl with wavy fair hair and big starry eyes screamed out don't go near it don't go near it as soon as there was comparative quiet kelson spoke as you can see ladies and gentlemen he said this animal is genuinely savage 
it is not like the tigers one sees in menageries drugged and deprived of their natural weapons teeth and claws it comes direct from india where its reputation as a man-eater is widespread i am not however intimidated its growls merely amuse me quaking all over he approached the cage and staring fixedly into the tiger's face made the prescribed passes in an instant the whole attitude of the great cat changed dropping to its forelegs it rubbed its head against the bars and purred a low buzz of astonishment burst from the audience and kelson now assured that the spell had worked waved his disengaged hand in the most gallant fashion at the audience and strutted into the cage he shook paws with the tiger patting it on the back sat down by its side and whilst pretending to be on the most familiar terms with it took every precaution to avoid coming in too close contact with its teeth and claws the audience was charmed the men cheered the ladies waved handkerchiefs and the only disappointed persons present were a few belligerent and bloodthirsty boys and a suffragette who severally and for diverse reasons would have relished the performances of a savage tiger but had little sympathy with the performance of a tame one the next surprise that mr kelson had for his audience was the announcement that he could interpret the language of animals at his invitation a dozen members of the audience came on to the platform and stood near the cage looking steadily at the tiger he then pronounced the mystic words meta ra ka va avankana holding up his right hand with the thumb turned down and stretched right across the palm and the little finger extended to the utmost in an instant the great secret the secret that darwin had studied so strenuously for years was revealed to him the language of animals was olfactory the tiger spoke to him through the sense of smell through his nose instead of his ears it regulated and modified the odor it gave off from its body and which worked its way out through the pores of its skin just as human beings regulate and modify the intonations of their voices indeed so delicate are the olfactory organs of animals that the faintest of these language smells makes an impression on them which impression is at once interpreted by the brain if an animal wishes to leave a message behind it it merely impregnates some article a leaf or a root or a clump of grass or merely the ether with a brain smell and any other animal happening to pass by the spot within a certain time in favourable weather will at once be attracted by the smell and be able to interpret it that is the reason one so often sees an animal suddenly stop at a spot and sniff it it is reading some message left there by some other animal all this and more kelson explained to his audience who were exceedingly interested many of them getting up to ask him questions he also reported to them the tiger's conversation which consisted chiefly of complaints against the management with regard to its food to be everlastingly fed on scraps of horse flesh it said when there are dozens of plunk young women sitting in the stalls under its very nose was tantalizing to a degree would mr kelson kindly speak to whoever was responsible for such cruelty and negligence a bear and a crocodile having been tamed in the same manner and their remarks interpreted to the audience the entertainment concluded the next day the papers were full of it the planet under the startling announcements recovery of the lost senses more extraordinary feats in cockspur street leon hamar becomes invisible at will narrated all that had occurred the monitor if anything more sensational declared the language of animals discovered at last the problem of breathing under water solved dematerialization at will established and even the courier the steady ever cautious old courier england's premier paper created a precedent by the use of a quite conspicuously large type vide the following the age of miracles revived actual case of subduing and conversing with wild animals recovery of the properties of invisibility of walking on water and of breathing under water as before there were innumerable cases of imitation many of them unhappily resulting in the death of the imitator 
at dover for instance a congregationless minister convinced that he had the requisite amount of faith announced from the pulpit that he intended walking on the water in the harbour after service thousands flocked to see him but despite the fact that he said i will i will with the greatest emphasis the unkind waves would not support him indeed since they swallowed him it might almost be said that the reverend s supported the waves for two whole days there was regular stampedes of experimenters to hyde park and regent's park and the banks of their respective waters resounded with the words i will walk i will walk succeeded by splashes and cries for help nor was the water feet the only one that induced imitators crowds flocked to the zoological gardens and the various houses were literally packed with people trying to get into conversation with the animals these attempts being also marked by a large proportion of fatal results one old gentleman a fellow of the royal society carried away in his enthusiasm to talk with a tiger after making what he thought to be the correct signs slipped his nose through the bars of the tiger's cage and had it promptly bitten off whilst the girl in her endeavours to sniff the crocodiles and so get in conversations with them fell in their midst and was torn to pieces before help arrived however these fatalities only served as an advertisement to the firm and hundreds of people for whom there was not even standing room were turned away from the house nightly but later on there were hitches curtis whose dislike to vegetarian diet steadily increased when dining one evening in the club could no longer withstand the sight of roast beef the smell of it tickled his palate unmercifully take this infernal mess away he said pushing a plate of nut steak from him in disgust and let me have a full course entree soup fish meat everything you've got chartreuse and a liquor and bring it quick i'm famished he ate and ate and drank and drank until it was as much as he could do to rise from the table and then in excellent spirits he repaired to cockspur street how he got on to the stage he could never tell everything was in a haze around him until there was a dull crash in his ears and he suddenly found himself drowning no one at first noticed his helpless condition but attributed his antics to part of the programme and he almost certainly would have been drowned had it not been for lillian rosenberg who being quite by chance in front of the house perceived he was drunk the moment he came on the stage she flew to the wings and just in the nick of time got two of the supers to haul him out of the tank of course it was announced with a pretty apology by mr hamar that mr curtis had been taken ill kelson immediately came on with his animals and the uh, audience departed without the slightest suspicion as to the truth hamar was furious you idiot he said to curtis that all comes of your making a beast of yourself you would sacrifice matt and me for your insatiable craving for meat and alcohol can't you see it was a trick of the unknown to make us break the compact had you been drowned the partnership would of course have been dissolved and it would have been your fault you must obey your injunctions damn it you must and hamar spoke so fiercely that curtis was for once in a way cowed and solemnly promised that he would not repeat the offence kelson was the next culprit and his misdoings were indirectly associated with the foregoing incident lillian rosenberg's action in saving curtis's life thrilled him to the core and called into play all his ardent passion he had seen her sitting in the front of the house and had come upon the scene just as she was urging the supers to go to curtis's assistance and he then thought she had never looked so lovely come out with me to-morrow afternoon he whispered hamar's going out of town and before she could stop him he had kissed her kelson hardly expected lillian rosenberg would accept his invitation but on arriving at the place he had named he was delighted beyond measure to find her there nor could any one have been nicer to him no girl he told himself who did not in some degree at least reciprocate his sentiments could have allowed him to stare into her eyes as she did or squeeze her hands as he did he took her to the ladies drawing-room of his club where there were plenty of quiet secluded nooks and there whilst she poured out tea for him he once more related to her all his early deeds and ailments real and imaginary and all his ideals and aspirations lillian rosenberg was most sympathetic you should have been a poet she said there is something about you that is quite byronic 
and kelson who had never even heard of byron was immensely flattered will you come to the jeweller's with me he said and choose whatever you like best those fingers of yours are made for rings rings of all sorts and he gave them a gentle pressure she let him escort her to bond street and followed him gaily into raymond's but when it came to accepting a ring from him she laughingly refused and chose instead the most expensive diamond bracelets and pendants in the shop some of these she wore the rest unknown to him of course she sold sending the proceeds anonymously to shield davenport who was starving when kelson went on stage that evening his thoughts were so far away planning for his honeymoon that he entered the cage of a newly imported lion without having made the necessary signs and would most certainly have been mangled out of recognition had not one of the supers perceiving how matters lay rushed to his assistance and kept the lion at bay with a pole till further help could be procured it had been a narrow squeak and to kelson the bare idea of continuing his performance was appalling his nerves were as he himself put it anyhow and he preferred retiring for the rest of the evening but hamar would not hear of it this is the second bungle we've had he said and the reputation of the firm is seriously at stake you must go on again and retrieve it and kelson trembling all over was obliged to reappear after it was all over and he had bowed out into the wings hamar led him aside don't look so damned pleased with yourself he said i don't half like the look of things this is the third time the unknown has tried to trap us the fourth time it may be successful take care end of chapter nineteen read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california chapter twenty of the sorcery club by elliot o'donnell this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter 20. The Stage of Hauntings. Much to the relief of the trio, the end of stage three was at length reached, and, thanks to Hamar, reached without further mishap. To keep Curtis and Kelson up to the mark, Hamar had worked indefatigably he had never relaxed his efforts in the strict watch he kept over them and he had unceasingly impressed upon them the vital importance of obeying to the very letter the instructions they had received from the unknown the part he had thus taken upon himself the difficulties he had to encounter in this unceasing vigilance had produced a new hamar a hamar that was a personality a personality so utterly unlike the old hamar the meek and servile clerk as to make one wonder if there could possibly be two hamars outwardly and physically the same inwardly and psychologically diametrically opposed a year ago curtis and kelson would have ridiculed the idea of being afraid of hamar such an idea would have struck them as simply absurd but they were afraid of him now they dreaded his anger more than anything more even than the prospect of infringing their compact with the unknown we have made pots of money curtis remarked one day why can't we give up work and enjoy it because i say no hamar hissed no we can't give up not at least until the last stage has been safely gone through to give up now would be to break the compact well why not curtis mumbled why not hamar cried heavens man can't you understand can you form no conception of what failure to keep the compact means has the memory of that night of that tree and all the foul things it suggested passed completely out of your mind it hasn't out of mine it is as clear now as it was then and often mark this both of you often when i am alone in the night i see queer luminous shapes shapes of repulsive vegetable growths of polyps and of disgusting tongues that come toward me through the gloom and circle slowly round the bed whilst the whole room vibrates with soft mocking laughter you know how mirrors shine in the moonlight well the other night when i looked at mine i saw in it the reflection not of a face 
but of two light evil eyes that looked at me and smiled smiled with a smile that said more plainly than words i am waiting and that is what the shapes and the very atmosphere of the place at night always seem to say we are waiting you are enjoying the joke now we shall enjoy it later on if we knew exactly what was in store for us it wouldn't be so bad but it is the vagueness of it the vagueness of the horrors that the unknown has hinted at that makes it so appalling we may die awful deaths or we may not die at all the shapes indefinite and misty no longer but materialized wholly and entirely materialized may come for us and take us away with them and it is to prevent this that i am urging you compelling you to stick to the compact and give the unknown no loophole think of the tremendous rewards if we succeed in passing through the last stage as i have said before curtis need do nothing else but eat whilst you matt can become a mormon and marry all the pretty girls in london this speech had the desired effect and nothing more for the time at least was said about retiring do you think leon is quite er like er like us kelson said when hamar left them after administering his admonition at times he hardly looks human his face is such a funny colour such a lurid yellow and his eyes so piercing he gives me the jumps i can't bear to think of him at night rubbish curtis growled you imagine it there's nothing of the spook about leon he's of this world and nothing but this world it was odd however that from that time he too began to have the same feeling the feeling that hamar was perpetually watching them watching them awake and watching them asleep curtis awoke one night to see standing on his hearth a shadowy figure with a lurid yellow face and two gleaming dark eyes which were fixed on him he called out and it vanished of course it's the nut steak and thus he tried to assure himself but he was badly scared at the time another night he saw someone he took to be hamar peeping at him from behind the window curtains he threw a slipper at the figure and the slipper went right through it if hamar's phantom had been the only thing he saw he would not have minded much but both he and kelson soon began to see and hear other things curtis frequently saw half materialized forms forms of men with cone-shaped heads and peculiarly formed limbs stealing up the staircase in front of him and turning into his bedroom vanished there he heard them moving about long after he had gone to bed sometimes they would glide up to the bed and bend over him and though he could never see their eyes he could feel they were fixed mockingly on him once he saw the door of his wardrobe slowly open and a white something with a dreadful face half human and half animal steal slyly out and disappear in the wall opposite and once when he put out his hand to feel for the matches they were gently thrust into his palm whilst the walls of the room shook with laughter kelson was equally tormented though the phenomena took rather a different form alone in his bedroom at night the shape of the room would frequently change either the walls and ceiling would recede and recede until they assumed the proportions of some vast chamber full of gloom and strange shadows or they would slowly very slowly close in upon him as if it were their intention to crush him to death a feeling of suffocation would come over him and he would gasp choke beat the air with his arms be at the verge of losing consciousness and then there would be a loud mocking laugh and the walls and ceiling would be in their proper places again at other times he would see strange figures on the wall numbers of circles that would keep on revolving in the most bewildering fashion then suddenly they would leave the wall and slowly approach him increasing in circumference and the same thing would happen as happened with the wall and ceiling he would undergo the whole sensation of asphyxiation and be on the brink of swooning when there would be a loud peal of evil satirical laughter and the circles would instantly disappear sometimes the bedclothes would assume extraordinary shapes 
sometimes the articles on his dressing-table, sometimes his clothes, and once, when he was about to put on his bedroom slippers, he found them already occupied, occupied by icy cold feet. Another time, when he put out his hand to take hold of a tumbler, he put it on the back of another hand, smooth, cold, and pulpy. Hardly a night passed without some sort of manifestation happening to one or other of the trio, and even Curtis, fat and stolid Curtis, began to lose flesh and look harassed. On the eve of the initiation into stage four, the three, separating for the night, retired to their respective quarters in a far from pleasant state of expectation. Hamar was undressing when there came a loud ring at the telephone outside his door. Hello, he called out. Who are you? Are you Mr. Hamar? A voice asked breathlessly. Hamar replied in the affirmative, and the voice continued. I'm Mrs. Anderson Waite of thirty queen's mansions queen's gate i have been holding a seance here with some of my friends and most extraordinary things have happened and are still happening there are violent knockings on the wall and ceiling and the table has become positively dangerous it has repeatedly sprung into the air and savagely assaulted several of the sitters it has thrown one lady on to the floor and despite our efforts to prevent it has trampled on her so viciously that she is badly hurt and the doctor who has just arrived thinks very seriously of it we wanted to stop but some strange power seems to be forcing us to go on the table has wrapped out your name and address and says it has something important to communicate with you and that unless you come here at once it won't answer for the consequences all right hamar said i'll come i'll be with you in less than half an hour when hamar arrived at queen's mansions he found a terrified party of ladies awaiting him in the entrance to the flat thank goodness you've come they exclaimed all together we've been having an awful time the table has driven us out of the drawing-room it is obsessed by a devil let me have a look at it hamar said and i'll soon tell you the leader of the party mrs anderson waite very cautiously opened the drawing-room door and hamar peered in in the centre of the room was a large round ebony table that commenced to rock in the most sinister fashion the moment hamar looked at it it evidently wants to speak with me hamar said you had better leave me here with it for a few minutes do take care mrs anderson waite said as she shut the door it may want to murder you if it does ring this bell and we will all come to your assistance hamar gave her an assuring smile but he was by no means as much as ease as he pretended to be he stood staring at the table too fascinated to take his eyes off it and too afraid to move at length however pulling himself together and convinced the table was the medium through which the unknown wished to give him fresh instructions he stealthily approached it he addressed it, and it rapped out to him that he must at once obtain pen and ink and take down what it wished to say. Obtaining the requisite materials from Mrs. Anderson Waite, he sat down and was preparing to write on his knee, when the table told him to rub its surface briskly with his left hand, to trace on it the three Atlantean symbols, that is, a club foot, a hand with the fingers clenched, and the long pointed thumb standing upright, and a bat and then to place his paper on it and transcribe what it had to say hamar obeyed and after sitting for exactly three minutes with his pencil between his fingers he felt a cold pulpy hand laid over his impelling him to write with lightning-like rapidity the script read as follows to hamar curtis and kelson to the three of you in common is given the knowledge of inflicting all manner of torments and diseases of imparting all kinds of injurious properties and of causing plagues in the first place you must understand that the essence of life comprising the psychical psychological and physical permeates every part of the living corporeal body and that any limb or fragment of skin or flesh cut off from the living corporeal body retains the essence of life comprising the psychical and physical in its full vigour and entirety consequently if a person have grafted on to them a piece of skin or flesh or be inoculated with the blood or veins of a tiger 
then that person not merely becomes liable to all the physical infirmities of the tiger but may if the counteracting influences are not sufficiently strong partake of all the tiger's psychological characteristics thus if you give a person in whom there is a latent tendency to drink a drop of drunkard's blood and a glass of wine or sweet or pill no matter what that person will at once take to drink thus mark you people can be metamorphosed into libertines suicides idiots and murderers this metamorphosis can also be produced by means of a magnet called the magnus microcosmi which is prepared from substances that have a long association with the human body and are penetrated by its vitality such substances are the hair and blood take either one of them and dry it in a shady and moderately warm place until it has lost its humidity and odour by this process it will have lost too all its mumia that is to say its essence of life and is hungry to regain it it is now a magnus microcosmi or a magnet for attracting diseases and properties and if it be placed in close contact with a criminal or lunatic it will be filled with his essence of life and may then be used as a means of infecting other people with his pernicious qualities bury it under the doorstep of the person you wish infected or hide it in his house or mix it well with earth and plant a shrub in the earth and the vitality the magnet took from the criminal or lunatic will pass into the plant and if the plant or even flower of the plant be given to any one that person unless she or he be a person absolutely free from the germs of vice will be attracted to it and greatly affected by it or again the earth over the grave of a lunatic or criminal will contain his essence of life that is his vitality which impregnates everything around it and if that earth be placed somewhere in the immediate presence of a person in whom there are latent tendencies to vice then that person will be affected by it and through these methods of using the essence of life that is impregnated with the disease you wish to inflict you may infect people with all kinds of incurable ailments but a quicker and equally sure method of smiting people with disease such as cancer fever epilepsy apoplexy etc of smiting them blind deaf dumb lame etc or bringing upon them all kinds of accidents is to make an image of the person you wish to torment and setting it in front of you preferably at times when the moon is new or in conjunction with venus mars or saturn concentrate with all your will on whatever injury you wish to inflict if for example you desire the person to become blind stick a pin or thorn or nail in the eyes of the image if deaf in its ears if maimed cut a limb off the image if to have a certain disease will very earnestly that he or she shall have that disease you may thus too torment the object of your aversion with plagues of insects and vermin if you desire to bewitch your neighbor's milk wine or any food he or she has you may do it by placing the mumia that is the vehicle containing the essence of life of some criminal or lunatic in the immediate vicinity of the food etc or in the case of milk by giving it to the cow to eat or you may accomplish your design simply by means of concentration and an image always however whatever methods you employ prelude them with this prayer i conjure thee great unknown power that is antagonistic to man that was at the beginning that is now that will always be by the winds and rain and thunder and lightning by the swirling rivers by the moon by the sinister influence of the moon with venus mars and saturn help me obtain the perfect issue of all my desires which i seek to perform solely for the furtherment of what is detrimental to humanity amen and conclude them with the signs of the foot the hand and the bat if you desire to know anything further it will be unfolded to you in your dreams the hand that had been laid on hamar's was now removed the writing ceased the table rose several inches from the floor and struck the ladder three times in quick violent succession then it remained quiet and hamar knew by a subtle change in the atmosphere 
that all occult manifestations for that night at least were at an end the ladies were of course dying to know what had happened and like most ladies who dabble in spiritualism were ready to believe anything they were told hamar who had no intention whatever of telling them what had actually occurred satisfied them admirably he went home delighted far too delighted to sleep for he had in his possession now the greatest of all weapons the weapon to torment and with it what could he not do what could he not get he could get gladys end of chapter twenty read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california